Thank you for attending today's webinar. My voice, as you can tell, is just a little bit rough. So we're gonna try to make it through this this morning um, as quickly as possible, but still get the content out there. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, management of Brunswick grass and behavior grass seed production fields. This is something that's come up in the past couple of years. Uh, it's actually been around for quite a long time, uh, but it's become more of a problem the last couple of years, and that's what I'm going to talk about, and it's some of the progress that we've made um, this year and last year. So what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of history, follow that up with some identification characteristics, because that's what the key is, I believe, in managing this, because I feel like a lot of people don't really know that we have this species um, in fact, I didn't think we had it in Hardy County until I found three locations this past year. So I think identification is really necessary. Then I'm going to go through some preliminary herbicide evidence, which led us into our field studies that we conducted this year, and then end with a management study that we actually started in 2017. All right, so just a little bit of the history. Um, Brunswick grass is one of the paspalums. It's also known as brown seed paspalum. It's also a perennial warm season grass, much like our Bahia grasses that we are commonly used to. Native, native to uh, southern Brazil, northern Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Adapted to a wide variety of soil types, just like Bahia grass is, and was introduced um, <clears throat> by the Soil Conservation Service for soil conservation initially. It was looked at as a forage as well, <clears throat> potentially. Uh, one of the introductions, the first one, the PI-202044, actually made it to Arcadia, Florida, the plant material center that used to be there. And then there's another one that was actually released in 1993 uh, up in Americas, Georgia. And I'm not sure which one actually made it to Florida. It may be both of them, because we have seen two different biotypes out in the field as well. Um, so I'm not sure which one we're actually dealing with as far as the problematic <clears throat> biotype goes. So some of the agronomics and biology, it <clears throat> produces a thick sod with an aggressive root system. I would almost compare it to Kogan grass in, in that regard as far as the aggressive root system goes. Uh, it's competitive and tolerates overgrazing. Its production season is very similar to Pensacola Bahia grass. However, unlike Pensacola, it's a tetrapoid, like Argentine bahia grass is. And we'll see why that's important in a few minutes. It's intolerant to residue buildup. So what that means is if it's left ungrazed, unmowed, it tends to collapse. And that's according to some of my colleagues that work with forages. Uh, production is very similar to bahia grass, Pensacola. Four, four to five tons of dry matter per acre with similar TDN and crude protein. All right, so here's kind of our problem. We've had increased reports of Brunswick grass and Pensacola pastures and hay fields. It isn't very palatable. And the biggest problem with our seed production fields is that it contaminates seed. And the seed is very similar in size to Pensacola bahia grass. They can't really separate it all that well. So if they're trying to sell seed out of state, like many of our seed does go out of state, <clears throat> um, it's, it's sometimes rejected. So that's where our problem is. And a lot of fields in the past couple of years have had to be abandoned, at least as far as seed harvest goes, because they couldn't separate those seeds. So this is what a pretty bad infestation would start to look like in a behavior grass pasture. If uh, I was driving by this pasture, I'd probably be automatically think it was smut grass because that's kind of what it looks like if you're driving 70 miles an hour down the road. But <clears throat> upon closer examination, this is actually Brunswick grass. And <clears throat> these patches are actually a result of overgrazing the Bahia grass that's in that pasture. They're leaving the Brunswick grass alone and they're grazing the Bahia. All right, so how do I identify it? Well, you're going to see a lot of similarities between Brunswick grass and Pensacola bahia. The first uh, five characteristics or so, growing season, flowering, height, leaf shape, leaf size, 
and leaf pubescence are about the same. There's really not that much difference between them. <clears throat> and in fact, to be able to go out and look at them and say, oh, well, that's Brunswick grass, that's obvious. It's kind of difficult to do that. You have to look pretty closely at these plants to really see the difference. And this comes in the seed head with Brunswick grass having three to four alternate racemes versus Pensacola Bahia grass, more of a two racemes with a Y-shaped appearance. The seeds of Brunswick grass are brown coated, convex, versus Pensacola Bahia grass, they're tan colored and relatively flat. Seed weight, a little bit of difference there. You can't really weigh those in the field to really identify them. But the easiest way, at least for me, between if you don't have seed heads to identify it, is to look at the root system. Brunswick grass has long, thin rhizomes, much like Kogan grass. Whereas Pensacola Bahia grass is more, has short, thick <clears throat> uh, rhizomes that tend to be on the surface. All right, so just some pictures. Um, first picture on your left, the Bahia grass seed head uh, is of the left seed, the seed head, and the Brunswick grass in the first picture on the left is the right seed head with the three different branches on that racine. And then the picture on the right shows the Brunswick grass seed head, two of them with the seed as well. All right, so this is pretty common what we see out in a Bahia grass pasture up in, <clears throat> say, Citrus, Pasco, Levy County. All right, so what do you see? It's kind of hard to tell just looking at this that there's Brunswick grass in there. But if you start trying to look at things, a little bit closer, and those one circles were not yellow on my computer, or were not blue on my computer earlier. Um, but if you can see the blue ones on your screen, uh, those are Brunswick grass, and the yellow circles are highlighting the Bahia grass. All right, so, but like I said, if you don't have the seed heads, the next thing to do is to dig them up and, and look at the root systems. Bahia grass rhizomes on the left tend to be more on the surface, like I already said. The Brunswick grass rhizomes on the right tend to be below the soil surface and look much more like Kogan grass rhizomes. And so you have these long, thin rhizomes with nodes on them. And then the seeds, of course, I mean, this is something you can also use. Um, Seeds, like I said earlier, were flat, convex shaped with the brown <clears throat> for the Brunswick grass and tan colored seeds for the Bahia. All right, so when we first came up with this problem, we um, really didn't know what we were gonna do because there are not a lot of herbicides out there where you can take a grass out of the grass. That's pretty difficult. Um, one of the examples that we deal with a lot is smut grass because we take smut grass out of Bahia grass and we can do that. It takes some work. It takes some uh, patience sometimes. So we really, we're kind of banging our heads up against the wall, really didn't know which direction we we're going to go. And the reason I say that is because we know a lot about paspalums and herbicides. We know that <clears throat> Pensacola, which is a diploid, is sensitive to products that contain metsulfuron. So Escort, Pastora, Chaparral, we all know are going to negatively impact Pensacola, but they do not impact Argentine, which is a tetraploid. So with Brunswick grass being a tetraploid, we don't really think these are gonna be an option, okay? But it's still possible. It's something that we have yet to actually look at. So this is what I <clears throat> wanted to show you was, you know, Pensacola on your left that was treated with a third of an ounce of metsulfuron. This is 60 days after treatment. All that brown vegetation is Pensacola Bahia grass has died from the metsulfuron. Argentine on the right, 60 days after treatment, virtually no response by 60 days. At 30 days, you see a little bit of reddening on the leaf tissue but by 60 days, that red, red name goes away. All right, so 
that's why I'm not really keen on these products that control the, <clears throat> the diploids because uh, I don't think they're going to have much activity on the tetraploids like Argentine and Brunswick grass. All right, so sometimes we get the best ideas from our cooperators, and that's kind of what happened uh, with Brunswick grass. Before I get to this, I wanted to give you a little bit of update or give you some ideas of where we're going um, with hexazinone. Uh, various trade names, there's Velpar, Tide, Hexazinone, and Velosa, all active ingredient hexazinone. Uh, Velpar and Tide, Hexazinone are, are pretty much the same as far as the amount of hexazinone per gallon. Velosa is a little bit high, higher concentration. We use this primarily for smut grass management in pastures. Um, and we know it inhibits photosynthesis and uptake as both through the leaves and by soil uptake. But for smut grass, it's soil uptake, primarily where we're getting the activity. So we need rainfall. Okay, so that's just a little bit of primer before I show you the next slide. And this was a producer that was actually trying to control smut grass in his pasture. Uh, they knew that they did have some Brunswick grass out there as well, uh, but they were trying to control the smut grass. And I know that writing is really small. That was back in the day when I was using Snapchat to do stuff and send stuff out. Um, but anyway, in the green patch and kind of the upper left quadrant or circled in orange, uh, you'll see untreated Brunswick grass and the brown dead material out front of that is dead Brunswick grass. But you'll see some live clumps, okay? So those live clumps that are out there are smut grass. So even though they didn't kill smut grass, we had some ideas that maybe hexazinone would work on Brunswick grass. And we're actually digging up plants in this section that was brown, and those rhizomes were completely dead. So we were pretty excited, right? So this is back in 2017. We're pretty excited that we may actually have a tool that would work had another producer at that point in time that was actually looking at another different herbicide that they use in turf grass. That was gonna be very difficult to get labeled for pastures. Uh, and it had a lot of collateral damage, meaning that it was going to negatively impact the hair grass much more than hexazinone ever would. So thankfully this came along, we, we were able to go up to the site and look at this and get some ideas of where to move forward. So in 2018, uh, we went out in four different locations in Wildwood and Lacanto in July, and then Lacanto and Brooksville in August. And we sprayed uh, Tide Hexazinone from zero to four pints per acre at 30 gallons per acre. And we looked at Brunswick con grass control by counting plants before treatment and 30 days after treatment. We have not counted after that because we're more concerned about the regrowth next season. All right, so if you've ever tried to count Brunswick grass, it's very painful and not very fun, but <clears throat> that's why I had Joseph and Clay to do it. All right, uh, so this, these results are from those four locations, averaged over all four locations. There's no uh, site by treatment interaction which is very nice. Uh, but basically what you see at a half pint, we're reaching the upwards of 55% control at 30 days, All right? So we increase up to three pints, which three pints is where we need to be at least three pints for smut grass control. So Brunswick grass seems to be much more sensitive to hexazinone than smut grass is. And I have some pictures to show you in a second. But I believe as long as we're at two pints or above, I think that's gonna be somewhere where we need to be. Um, <clears throat> I'll get into the timing part later. All right, so just some pictures of some plots that were sprayed. Um, this is actually in Floral City where we just sprayed some strips early on. Um, two pints per acre, three weeks after treatment. Not a lot to see there, but if you can see the brown tinge throughout that entire plot. And that's Brunswick grass that's actually responding to that hexazinone at three weeks after treatment. 
obviously you increase rate, you start to see more of a response. And this is three pints per acre, three weeks after treatment. You can see how much Brunswick grass was there initially, because all the green material is actually Bahia grass. And then four pints per acre. We're actually starting to see some discoloration on the Bahia grass. That's pretty common. Um, even though we use that rate for smut grass control, this is pretty common to see. Within 30 days, that would flush out and be green. But this is also very quick, um, much quicker than I anticipated as far as the activity goes. So three pints per acre, one week after treatment, you can see all the necrosis in, in the first part of this plot. Um, it's just so rapid. Um, pretty happy with the results that we're seeing so far from the hexazimum studies. All right, I wanted to switch gears and talk about the Brunswick Management Study. This is something we started in 2017 because we didn't feel like we'd have a herbicide option initially. So we wanted to look at different cropping systems and tillage systems. So we took an area of a pasture, we split it in half, <clears throat> and we left one side untilled and the other side we conventionally tilled. We had four different cropping systems. One was bahia grass. We just <clears throat> planted the hair grass back that was kind of our check. And then we had a Roundup Ready soybean followed by during the summer growing season followed by Roundup Ready alfalfa in the winter or millet during the summer followed by ryegrass in the winter or cowpea in the summer followed by Roundup Ready alfalfa in the winter. We sprayed glyphosate um, in July of 2017 at a full rate, four quarts per acre. And then we planted in August. So we're a little bit later than I wanted to be, but that's just the way things worked out. In December of 2017, we applied another two quarts per acre over the entire experiment, except where bahia grass was planted. And we planted um, ryegrass in December and then alfalfa in January. And then this past spring, we sprayed two quarts per acre over the entire experimental area, except where we planted bahia grass. And then we planted back the Roundup Ready soybean, millet, or cowpea. And then this past fall, December, we, uh, we did not spray Roundup. Uh, however, we just went back with ryegrass instead of planting alfalfa <coughs> anywhere. All right, so to look at <clears throat> Control then, we actually did counts in each plot. Each plot was 20 feet wide by 200 long. We were kind of unsure of how much uh, Brunswick grass is actually in those plots. So we recorded accounts from 19 locations within each plot. And this is the average, <coughs> excuse me. This is the average density uh, per meter square. I have and no tillage is in the blue bars and conventional tillage is in the orange bars. And we see the Bahia grass, <clears throat> uh, very little recovery of the Brunswick grass. I was a little bit surprised at this. I expected to see uh, much more Brunswick grass coming in these plots than I did that I thought I'd see in the others. Uh, millet followed by rye grass actually had the lowest number of Brunswick grass plants coming back but we tend to have more Brunswick grass where we had the broadleaf crops growing. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I think that maybe the grasses are either A, more competitive uh, with the Brunswick grass or B, the rye grass might have some allelopathic effects uh, on, on the Brunswick grass. So that's something that we can also look at. My phone's talking to me. All right, so as far as the management goes, I feel like we still have a lot to learn. Uh, we had some growers that put out some commercial applications in April, and we looked at these fields in July. Uh, significant regrowth, still a lot of seed production from those applications, and those were applications of hexazinum. Uh, we don't know really about seedling recruitment the year after application. So we put these studies out, but how is this gonna affect long-term seedling recruitment? Something we don't know. There's not a lot of information on seed germination characteristics or longevity in the soil seed bank uh, on these species. So there's, there's some things we can do 
to, to look at that. We don't know how rainfall affects activity short and long term on Brunswick grass with hexazina. So we know rainfall <clears throat> can really impact control of smut grass with hexazina. So that's something we need to look at. Um, will crop rotation help? And that's kind of what we're trying to answer with that management study. Uh, we know that producers that have rotated from pastures into peanut and then back to pastures, they still tend to have Brunswick grass, but they're rotating into a broadleaf crop. So our management study might show that rotating into annual grass crops may actually be more beneficial than rotating into um, an annual other crop. And before I end, I wanted to thank uh, my cooperators. There's quite a few of them. Clay Cooper is actually the one I've been working with the most on this, as well as Ed Jennings and Marcelo Wallau and Ann Blunt. And then the people have actually been phenomenal working with uh, for our field research sites have been the Rooks family, both Larry and Eugene, uh, John Thomas and Leon McClellan from m and Dairy, John Massaro, Jim Fenton, the Bartle brothers, and Johnny Melton, he has been extremely helpful. He's been the one that's been showing me all the fields that they've been sprayed commercially and uh, helping us uh, with seed sources and whatnot. So I really wanna thank them for all of their assistance over the past year and the years to come. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me over email. Uh, also, if you have questions from the seminar or webinar, Please start typing them into your question box now. Um, our next webinar will be February 12th, and Dr. Arthington will be presenting on his animal science work. Are there any questions from the room? I know that was really fast. But... Jeff. Have I found any here on the station? I have not, but I found it right across the road. The seed head could be, but it's not similar. Um, yeah, so the plant's actually gonna look very much like Bahia. It's not gonna look like a Brachiaria. Does that answer your question a little bit better? Okay. Yeah, across the road on 663 on wards, yeah. Randy. Tetraploid versus diploid. It's the number of chromosomes. So tetraploids have four times the number of chromosomes. Joe can tell you more. He's a forage agronomist. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, not seeing any online. Cattle do seem to select around it. Right. Yeah, it's just like smut grass. Even though there can be value of smut grass, they'll select around it too. Yeah. All right. Well, I thank you for attending today. Like I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.